Welcome back, everybody, to the Investors Roundtable. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and uh, I hope this isn't too late to say, but I hope everybody had a very nice Thanksgiving, lots of turkey, all the sides, and most importantly, we're safe. But uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And I'm very excited for our topic that we're going to be doing today, which is mergers and acquisitions. And before we get into that, let me introduce our entire panel today, going counterclockwise, because we're all contrarians here. We got Stephen Keel from Arquitos Capital. What's up, Stephen? Yeah, good to see you, Bobby, and the others here. And uh, welcome into holiday season. You guys, hold on. Did you guys like that? I'm going counterclockwise because we're because we're contrarian. How about that? that was, <laughs> not, not bad, right? That, that was pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> you know me, always fishing for compliments. But it's anyway. a little early for that, but yeah, we got we got you. I think uh, right. we'll, yeah, we'll we'll see how we'll see how the conversation goes, though. Maybe we all agree today that you know this is a, a, a rich merger environment, and all of these are very fair prices that have been paid. <laughs> Touche. You never know. You never know. And we also got Kevin Shea at the Good Prick. Which might I add? Please go follow him on Twitter. All right, we got a challenge. If he doesn't get to 500 followers, I think it's before the end of the year, he has to do a Jack Black style WAP video for everybody to see. I don't know if you want to see that. I, I'm partially curious to see it, but either way, you should go follow him. He's been uh, he's been getting after it on Twitter actually the last few days here. So, uh, Kevin, what's going on? Ah, having a good time on Twitter. Yeah, you are. You're doing yeah. you're doing some good stuff. You're doing a little TA. You're doing a little, uh, you know, know little what, know what, whether it matters or not, but we'll find out, won't we? It matters to it's me. A, it's a challenge. This is true, but it matters to me. I think it's very well. Cool. Then I'm doing it for you, Bobby. That's there it. you go. That's right. All right. And we also got joining us today. We got Adrian Day from Adrian Day Asset Management. How you doing, Adrian? I'm fine, thank you. And yes, you know I'm English, so we don't celebrate uh, Thanksgiving in November. We celebrate Thanksgiving July 4th. July 4th. Because we were happy to get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think session over. That that that's that was the mic drop for this whole entire round table right there. Uh, but Adrian, thanks for joining us. And Adrian, uh, we appreciate well, while, you letting us go. Yeah, while we're on the subject, how how did Hamilton uh, how was Hamilton when it played in London? What was the reception? Oh, you know, it was Good it was question. quite popular, frankly. I mean, as a musical, you could ask a hundred people under the age of forty, you know, who's Hamilton, and they don't know. Well, they wouldn't have known a year ago. But as a musical, it was very popular. Yeah. Well, probably the same in the U.S. That percentage. But yeah. So when yeah. the when the King came out, was it quiet, or did 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 uh, the you crowd know, I laugh? Seen, I haven't seen the musical, uh. so I. I don't know. Oh, we need to get you a Disney Plus account. You should, uh, we, we need, and then we're going to record you just watching that one scene. Okay. Because right. <laughs> I think that'll, I think that'll be good. Well, um, you know, King George, Matt King George was a great admirer of George Washington. You know that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know. All right. Well, okay. Anyway. Speaking hey, come, of, come speaking for the of stocks and, and stay for the historical uh, percent perspective. Seriously. I was going to say, I mean, my segue was going to do, be speaking of mergers and acquisitions, or I guess in the, in that case, a, a spinoff, you know, oh man, we're, I'm just, this coffee, I got some good coffee this morning. We're, we're kicking ass. You know, uh, I, I, I knew George Washington. <laughs> he was, was kind of, he was tall and he had wooden teeth, but other than that, you know, he was just a regular old guy. Has there, has there ever been a company that had a activist spinoff of a, of a wholly owned subsidiary? Because that, that's basically what happened, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty good. All right, guys. Well, as I said, this week's topic, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we had, uh, you know, the inspiration for this topic was that there was a couple big deals that were announced this week in the large cap space. You know, Salesforce buying Slack, uh, Uber finalized its purchase of uh, Postmates. So, you know, before we kind of dive in to, you know, what you kind of look for in mergers and acquisitions, you know, what what's some of your quick takes on what you've seen thus far in 2020 and in, in what I think some of us would agree. I mean, it's been a very active uh, uh, M&A activity going on specifically. So, uh, Stephen, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I could see it um, ramping up, to be honest with you. And, and, you know, look, I'm more of a special situation style of investor. And there was a certain time period during COVID where 
there was so much uncertainty that nothing was really happening. You know, there was uh, the companies were trying to determine the long term uh, what what would happen long term, kind of on their own businesses, and it was very difficult to analyze outside businesses. Uh, but now things are settling down a little bit. We're getting a little more uncertainty. It seems like we're having, you know, we'll be getting a, um, a uh, uh, what's it called? You know, COVID uh, <clears throat> will will kind of hopefully recede here as time goes by. And, and no disrespect to those people who are suffering it from it right now. But uh, you know, once you have the vaccine and that becomes uh, has widespread use and travel starts to happen again, and you get a little more certainty and perspective on on industries. Uh, then these companies, some companies who uh, may actually be in trouble will have more divest divestitures. They may spin off certain parts of their subsidiaries. They may even look to sell themselves. And I think at this point, you know, over the next few months, you start to see companies who are the winners and losers here, uh, who were the, the great management teams and who were not so good, um, who are struggling, who, who are looking to take market share. And that's when you get more of these corporate uh, special situations, company specific things happening. So some of it will be divestiture, some of it will be, you know, even closing down of certain divisions, uh, struggling of particular companies. Uh, but again, topic of this conversation is uh, there'll be takeovers, there'll be there'll be a lot of take a lot more, I think it'll ramp up, honestly, over the next three or four months, uh, not only because of more certainty, more you know, kind of accurate projections can be made about some of these companies, but there's still a lot of liquidity in the market. And so the Fed is there, the interest rates are low. Um, and uh, those those management teams who have done well during this uh, time period rightfully should be aggressive. And so I, I could see what's happened, started to happen just over the last few weeks or month. Uh, I, I could see that happening in, in spades over the next six months. Very good. And Kevin, what do you think? I would concur with that. I, I'm going to um, say the same basic thing. I think that there's going to be an awful lot of out, uh, fallouts from different situations. And uh, there's going to be numerous companies that are going to be in a situation, as, as Stephen described, that uh, will make it palatable for them to go out and begin to at least evaluate uh, the potentials that, that exist out there. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities, a lot of deals. And there's going to be a lot of uh, bad deals to be done as well. I mean, there's going to be an awful lot of people who jump at it just because of the fact that they're there. Um, and I, I, as we go into this thing more and more, I think those are the things that people have to look at it. From my perspective, I look at it more from a strategic perspective. Um, unlike Stephen, I'm not, I'm not really kind of looking at special, special situations. I just look to see whether or not it's appropriate for these companies to actually undertake any sort of strategy. I'm coming at it from that perspective of um, operations and execution, strategy, management, and things of that type. Um, and I think if we go into this thing, you know, my look at some of these, some of these deals are, they go to hell real fast. I mean, they really are some bad deals that are going to come out of this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and I've seen bad deals uh, consistently occur. And one of the ones that just recently occurred is, uh, is the, uh, it not, wasn't a merger and acquisition, but it was a participation uh, uh, in which GM set, set up a long-term deal with Nikola and that thing went the, that thing went south faster than you can shake a stick at. Uh, so I think there's an awful lot of deals like that as well. That, that it's not a merger, it's not an acquisition, but it's a participation, or however you want to describe it. And I'd like to be able to enter that into conversation as well. Some of these some of these equity positions that really have gone south. Oh, we're definitely going to be talking about some bad deals. And and Kevin, real quick for full disclosure, do you uh, are you a shareholder in GM and or uh, uh, Nicola? Nicola, no, I'm not. Okay, gotcha. All right. Adrian, what <laughs> don't we'll get there. I, I I'm I'm saving your PGP ness for that. Okay, don't worry, it's coming. But uh, Adrian, so what, what's your take as well? Yeah, no, I mean I agree with what everyone said. I mean, there's a couple of things I'll add. I mean, one is typically, and painting with a very broad brush, typically you seem to get more mergers and acquisitions in really strong markets uh, when prices are high and, and everyone's euphoric. Uh, that's when you seem to get more more um, mergers and acquisitions, both because uh, shareholders are pressuring for companies to do something and to grow, and maybe companies sometimes have limited growth within their own uh, existing business. And of course, you know that's precisely the wrong time to be doing it. It's it's really it's really uh, ironic how few, relatively few, um, mergers and acquisitions you get 
when things are really, really tough. This is an unusual circumstance, of course, because as has been pointed out with the, with the lockdowns and the economic restrictions, you do have a lot of, let's say, good quality companies that are in financial straits. And yet at the same time, other companies have been doing remarkably well. The stock market's high, they can raise equity easily with interest rates so low, they can raise debt uh, cheaply. And so in many ways, this is a sort of ideal time for stronger companies to be looking for, um, you know, their brethren that haven't fared well uh, during this period. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is that um, it varies from industry to industry, of course, but the economic restrictions in many cases have made, bless you, have made uh, due diligence more difficult. I mean, certainly in the mining sector, I know you're gonna ask me about that later, but certainly in the mining sector, it's been very difficult for companies to do due diligence. Australia's locked down. Americans cannot travel to Australia. They cannot travel to Canada. So you can't actually go on the ground and look at properties. And that's obviously true with a, with a lot of different industries. It varies industry by industry, how much you actually need to, you know, um, if you're buying a restaurant, you actually want to eat there, for example, and not just look at the numbers. But um, so I think this is, you know, once, once the restrictions ease, I suspect we're going to see a ramp up in, um, in mergers and acquisitions just because there's probably a lot of stuff in the pipeline where people are just waiting for that final due diligence. You know, Adrian, just on uh, real quick on, on just going on the, the mining resources track real quick. You know, I, I, I've noticed it. I mean, I, I don't know if it's just because of the travel restriction and not being able to go to properties, but it seems like there's been a bit of discipline and not too many, too much M and A going on right now. And also, you know, if there's one sector that's pretty good about buying low and looking at, you know, when the market cycles down. I mean, how many how many mergers and, and buyouts were there in the last what five years when gold was really in in, in dire straits, you know, and sub twelve hundred, you know, uh, price points. Right, we won't get too much into mining soon, but I, I just wanted to point that out that that's something that I was seeing specifically. Yeah, I was going to say, don't ask me all the questions on mining right at the beginning, because then I'll have <laughs> nothing else to say. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, there's, there's clearly, a, there, there's a, there is a newfound discipline, because in 2010, 11, 12, companies went crazy, overpaying for marginal assets. Do you know, within three years, from, from 2012 to 2014, mining companies wrote off, not wrote down, wrote off almost 80% of the money that they spent in 2011 and 12 and 13. That is just absolutely unbelievably, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so, you know, managements were fired and people, people have come in with this newfound discipline that we're up the profitable ounces, not growth for growth's sake. So yes, that's part of it. But I think also talking to companies in depth, there are some deals in the pipeline. And once they can do that final due diligence, I think you're gonna see see quite a few very good all right well adrian don't worry i have another mining question for you later and i'll save that for i'll save that for down the road but you know kevin let's unleash the good prick all right let these bad deals you know that we've been seeing like what you know what's been your impression why are some of these partnerships happening i mean is it is it undue pressure based on some uh some of these trends that we're seeing out there like what's been going on and then why do they fail you know, it's rather interesting to me. I think the comment that was made, I'll summarize it to the point where the money burning a hole in your pocket, you know, those things tend, tend to be what's going on. And also, I think there's a, a tremendous amount of hype going on these days. And I mean, we look at for Nikola, for example, is in electric vehicle. The electric vehicle market is, is seriously overhyped right now, in my opinion. I mean, granted that it's got a long, it's got a long future in front of it, but right now it's getting, it's getting crazy, crazy. Um, so, you know, people like people like GM is jumping into this thing, and I, again, we, we know that I know Ford. And Ford has got a, a deal with um, Rivi, Rivian, Rivian, I think it is. Um, but it's a it's a basically an investment deal. Um, when they and again, I just don't I just don't see it. Like Nikola, and can you imagine? Can you imagine that GM does all this vetting of Nikola supposedly, only to find out that 
I forget who it was. Was it? Um, I forget the company that was the that was the short short guys on it. They did the investigation with Nicola and found that that the company is real crap. You know, and of course, what happened was literally what was it? Three months after they announced it, GM basically said we're out of this thing. I mean, can you imagine the stupidity that must be going on inside of that company to 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 see to do a deal that they don't fully vet and some I forget maybe you know Stephen, but I don't know who the uh, the short sellers were on this deal. But it was basically a guy. I mean, it was one guy, and that that's that's you see this. Uh, was that the, was that the Heidenberg guys? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it was basically one guy, and you know, it's a kind of an independent short seller, and I don't I don't want it to insult him in any way but the stories i've read is you know it's, it's just a guy doing kind of work out of his living room basically and when your competition right a competition but the gm has an entire team for this exactly and I, think, I'm saying. I think it goes to show that you know whether it's you know you get institutional euphoria also Absolutely and when you have right. that kind of hierarchical structure when the when the person at the top wants something to happen yep. Yep. <laughs> their minions will find a way to justify Absolutely. it and that's what happened here yep. uh, you I agree. Invest I so much time and you invest so much sort of a commitment to something that very few people will challenge it that happens a lot yeah, uh, yeah. i agree i agree avery and once the once the i know the i know how ford works um, and what the people at the top think, it's kind of surprising. Billy Ford is a very, very strong environmentalist and activist. Um, so if he gets a, a, what is it, a bug in his bonnet, <laughs> a bee in his bonnet, <laughs> um, then it's going to happen. And it's really quite fascinating. And I agree with that as well. I mean, I see these 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 really stupid uh, management decisions that are being made. And as you said, they have teams of people who get into this thing. They have lawyers who do this stuff. You know, so... What we what we are seeing is we're seeing you know a, a, a perfect example of of the whole thing going bad fast. I mean, how does that how does that happen? Why does it happen? I mean, you said it. It's they have teams of people, okay, and even to the point where I mean, even in my case, I mean, I, I have a history that I've done these deals, and you look at them and say, no, don't do the deal, don't do the deal, and somebody said, well. I'm going to do the deal. Well, you're an idiot, you know. So there are there are many many things I think that you, that, that we've talked about that uh, that make these deals um, really really bad. Okay, but the one thing that one thing that I would going kind to of point out, other than the fact that we see a, a bad deal, that um, you know I wrote I actually I spent some time in this thing. I actually was um, doing research on this thing 20 years ago, and uh, there's a great book. I couldn't find the guy's name. There's a great book that I read by. Professor at Princeton who went through an academic evaluation of, of various situations with regard to MA. And he said that something to the effect, I, this is all recall. And he's basically saying that something like 80% of uh, mergers and acquisitions that are done go to shit fast, but they just don't work. Um, and when you look at it, one of the things that, um, you know, why, why would you do an MA? Why, what's the purpose of an MA? Okay. And when I look at it, I actually, actually did spend some time writing this thing down that it's a strategic decision. You do it for either, you do it for a number of reasons. One, for revenue, to acquire the revenue, you know, to add to accrete to, you, to, accrete to your company. Two, for the technology that, that's underlying the company of the, that you, that, that you're being, that's being acquired. Uh, three, customers, you're basically increasing the customer base. Four, you're doing it because of a location, you need a strategic position in, 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 in internationally or whatever. And the other one is people, okay? So you're doing, you're doing these things for a number of different reasons. Um, every one of them is strategic, and they may be complementary, but you're certainly doing it for one reason or the other: revenue, technology, customers, location, or people. And there may be one of two others, but I think those are the primaries. And when we start to look at M&As, we have to kind of look at them as a result of when a company is is seeking to make make, make a, an acquisition, why are they doing it, and should they express that um, that that intent uh, pretty clearly? Um, one can speculate when it's when it's a done deal, but you know when you're looking at it, and of course, you know each one of these things comes with skeletons in the closet. So the vetting has to be done against your strategic intent. And if it's done improperly, then I think that's when you start to see all these things unravel. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I can go on and on and about how they unravel, but I think at least when we when we um, might talk about M and A. Uh, rather than being specific about it, we can talk about it in generalities about why they work and why would you take them. And then from there, uh, we might be able to get into some of these uh, more deep conversations. But that, 
that's what I kind of came to came to the I wrote down and want to make, make it uh, kind of part of the conversation. All right. So wait, Kevin. Yeah. What's the best business combination you've seen in the last 10 years? Uh, damn, he took the damn question out of my freaking mouth. Yeah, uh, I'm in your brain, Bobby. Ah, uh, co-producer, Bobby, you're killing me. Bobby, you're, since you're so uh, engaged, what is it? Come on, what's the answer? No, I, that was, I wanted the question. You tell me. No, you know what? Bobby should answer that then. That's what I'm saying. Kevin well, I, about it. actually, well, all right. I can't tell you the best, but I'll tell you, like, from a nerd perspective, I got to say the the Disney acquisition of Marvel is probably one of the best. Bar none. Bar none. I mean, from a, from a uh, just a fandom perspective and, you know, not having the whole universe and now you're creating such a value prop on Disney Plus and being able to create all those shows right there. I mean... Yeah, I, I mean, from a, I, I again, this is based on no research and you know dollars and cents wise, you know what that means or anything like that. But just well, if I, if you had to hold a gun to my head and as a nerd, I would yeah, and go back even further, that. you know, with with Pixar and I mean, does Disney Pixar, have something yeah. in its DNA that allows it to be more successful as an acquirer compared to others, especially in the media space? Yeah, I would argue that that. Um, and I've seen this happen, a uh, small company that I'm familiar with. Uh, what they did was that they projected themselves uh, as their value was that they very fully well understood how to do M&As, okay? Um, this company, I forget the exact specific, but we've done 16 M&As, okay? Whatever the hell the number is. And one would argue that if you've done 16 and they rec they're working out quite well, then you are a hero, okay? I think most people just do one. Okay, and one and done. You know, Disney may be doing a couple, but there are large, large companies do who do a number and, and do and do have a history of doing them well. Okay, yeah. um, I would I would argue Facebook also. I mean, just now now that I got the brain, I mean, Facebook's two acquisitions, WhatsApp and Instagram, those were va very value. I mean, they got a steal with Instagram if you really think about what how how what Instagram probably on its own is worth today. You know, yeah, I mean, the other question you have to ask is, do they operate completely independently? I mean, I'm not I'm not that familiar with Instagram and how it works uh, um, organizationally, or uh, Facebook for that matter. But I don't see how you can integrate those two technologies. They they probably operate independently of each other, and I'm not quite sure where the integration value is. Um, again, it's I'm I'm unfamiliar with it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the best the best mergers are obviously or acquisitions are when you can actually integrate and get cross benefits. Yep, it's yep. not just buying another company that happens yep. to be. <laughs> run independently yeah i would yeah. argue the same thing i mean i think in, i think the i think it fails where because the integration doesn't work you right. can't integrate your people you can't integrate your culture you can't integrate the technology um management becomes it's kind of funny to me you've probably seen it at the same time management becomes the ego driven where well you just acquired me and i want to be the ceo or the cfo or something of that type and there's a lot of pissing and moaning at the top level because people are trying to sit down and own what they've owned in the past. And then there are, there are nitpicking uh, egos that have to, be, have to be addressed as well. But again, all this stuff, and I think the, the, key, word is, the key word for a successful uh, uh, merger and acquisition is ultimately how they integrate. I couldn't agree more. I think that's probably the number one conversation if you're looking at an M&A or if you happen to be you know, on the inside having that conversation you know i think that's the number one question it's something i think about a lot so the uh, other part about it is again if i can continue and I, I don't want to take over the control here but the things that happen about why they don't work um for example in culture you got a big company buying a little company um that generally doesn't work at all um people flee you know sit down when you have a little company and a big company the people work for a little company because they want to um and they kind of avoid the big company. So when you see that happening going on, and in fact, with the company that I was on the board of directors on, um, the, our, our accounting firm was acquired. So our small accounting firm was acquired by a very large accounting firm and it, it went to shit real fast, okay, it really did. Um, the other part about it is the, inab the inability of integrating technology. When we have a technology, you have a technology, we're, gonna, we're buying you for the technology, but the technologies don't go together. We have, we have legacy systems, you have SaaS systems, you know, it just doesn't work. We wanna get into the SaaS business. Um, management bickering, as I said, I think that thing actually worked quite well. Uh, the technology was overvalued. 
and somebody goes in and says, "Now say, well, the technology, our technology is great." And then they work at it, they work at it, they work at it, and they find out that it really wasn't all that great to begin with anyway. Um, and the acquirer was was literally oversold on on total value. So there are a lot of bad deals. I think that they 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 are they are fundamentally uh, at the heart of uh, the inability to be able to integrate at the strategic level. Fair point. Hold on, real quick. You know, Stephen asks us all a question, and he didn't. I want him to answer uh, answer his own question as well. Don't worry, Kevin. I want to get back to this real quick because I think this is really important. But like, but but Steve, real, you know, in your opinion, what's been the best uh, acquisition or merger in the last uh, twenty years? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'm going to zag when you guys are zigging a little bit here because my universe is like a Berkshire Hathaway or Constellation Software or these things that these companies that are a little more uh, popular in the in the value investing community. And, you know, the interesting thing about the Berkshire acquisitions is there is no integration, right? <laughs> We're talking about how important integration here is. Uh, now, that's a little bit of a facade because they do then get access uh, to uh, funding, you know, in a way where, where generally these companies are already cash flow positive. So it's Berkshire actually getting access to the cash flow from these subsidiaries. And, uh, you know, one that you can think of uh, uh, the Burlington Northern uh, acquisition, well, now it's been probably 10 years or so now. Uh, and the amount of cash flow that's been kind of pumped up to the, the parent company and then able to be, you know, reinvested elsewhere is, is pretty impressive. Um, but I'm not saying that's my favorite acquisition of the last 10 years, but that's certainly a, a one that's quite different than the ones we're talking about here, whether it be Disney or, or even some of these that were more problematic. Um, look, Constellation Software has a system for this and, you know, they've been very successful at it. Um, ironically enough, and I, I don't, you know, I don't want to compare too much, but, you know, Valiant had a system too, <laughs> you know, um, and so, Two You're, pods in a row. He's bringing up Valiant. Yeah, I know. We're bringing up Valiant, and I try to <laughs> I try to touch on Tesla every time because they should probably make a stock acquisition right now. But uh, you know, when you when you look at just the system in and of itself is not, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to be a great investment. But uh, Constellation has a great way of integrating it and um, and and making the acquisition. Um, you know, making that that uh, those customers that they acquire and things like that more important, more valuable than what they were previously. And you know, that's something to look at. But given the valiant situation, you 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 know, it's not in and of itself. Um, so you know, I don't have a specific one. I generally am not as interested in kind of investing in that area. Um, I, I kind of like maybe the company that's been that's divested. <laughs> you know, a subsidiary, uh, I like to, like to own that, that legacy company, um, or like to look at that, but you know, in the value investing world, there are companies out there who, who do it, who do it fairly well. Um, and, uh, they don't generally make transformative acquisitions though, that require all of the integration, um, uh, you know, in a way that could be problematic, uh, I guess. So, you know, Look, execution is is more important than the idea, <laughs> generally. Absolutely, good point. Yeah, I, well, you know, the one one other point I wanted to bring up on this panel today is, you know, look, we're all microcap people here. You know, we 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 uh, we live in these waters, and you know, it, it's funny, especially when you whenever I go to you know mining shows or just general shows, and especially really it's mostly in that mining and healthcare space that you see this conversation come up a lot where it's, you know, these companies are getting themselves to a point so that they can get acquired and or partner, do a joint venture, stuff like that. You know, so, you know, for, for everyone on this panel, I mean, when you are evaluating potential um, investment in micro caps, you know, how much do you think about that long, that, that potential exit or looking upstream at who might, be out there to maybe take over some of these firms? You know, is that something that you even factor into your equation when you're thinking about a company? Or would you rather think about the company as if it was to last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years? You know, what, what's your thoughts there? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I mean, you're right in the mining space, if you're talking about exploration companies, particularly, I mean, you know, the end goal is to be taken over, because you don't expect these companies to build, um, you know, multi hundred well, billion dollar projects 
if their market cap is, you know, 100, 100 million. Um, my own way of looking at it is, is this. Um, I don't buy companies with very, very few exceptions. I don't buy a stock expecting it to be taken over or let's say buy a stock purely because purely for the takeover. You know, I'm buying companies that I think are good quality companies that have the ability to grow, that have the ability to whatever it is, develop a project, um, develop a product, um, you know, sell the product, whatever. Companies that have the ability to do well, and let's face it, if companies do well, then they might be attractive, you know, if in the mining space, for example. If an exploration company finds something, explores it, builds it, develops it, gets a resource out, gets a pre-fees out, they're much more likely to be taken over than the company that's doing badly. So I'm buying it because it's because I have confidence that they'll be able to do a good job, not because I'm expecting them to get taken over, if that makes sense. Yep. I, I would agree yep. with that entirely. I, I think the best thing that you can do as a company is build your business, execute, sell, ramp up revenue, build your business. And then the cards are on the table. Someone might come after you. I mean, I'm not buying anything that I'm buying because it's going to be taken out in two to three or four years. Um, it may be taken out or it may not be. And those are the, those are the, those are the things that you're unaware of when you're investing, unless that's, unless the, unless the company management specifically continually suggests that their goal is to uh, take some sort of exit. And even then, I don't see how that's you know, almost permanent. I just, you know, it's again, execute, do your job, grow revenues and see what happens. One thing we haven't yet talked about is SPACs and how that's affected <laughs> the marketplace here. And I, th I think, you know, there's a multitude of funded SPACs that have not yet made an acquisition yet. Clearly they're looking in the private markets. Um, but, you know, how is that affecting and I don't have the answer to this, but I'll throw this out, I guess, in a rhetorical way. And if anyone has any, any opinions, I'd love to hear them. But how is that affecting the marketplace in, in general? I mean, it's a different form of act. It's, it's a quasi IPO almost, but you know, it's M&A still. So it, it, it maintain it retains being rhetorical. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, at least I, from my perspective, I'm sure it, it, yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're just really focused on the private side of things, and just I, honestly, I, I I think it I think, you know, what, I, I just kind of spitballing here. I guess maybe it would have the effect in that maybe there's some of these other firms, you know, public companies that are not SPACs. Maybe it's encouraging them to say, you know, I, we may have we may have had this long term goal or vision that we might need to acquire some businesses in order to grow these various things that we see are compounding or growing. Um, and it's maybe forcing them to think about doing acquisitions probably a little bit sooner than they probably would have wanted to because some of these good deals uh, are going away. But also likewise, they might say, you know what, we're gonna take a step back and not focus on that because maybe some of these deals are gonna be at much higher premiums than we feel comfortable doing. You know, I, I feel like it's, it, it probably is all very firm dependent on, you know, what their short and long-term strategies are. I, yeah, I, and I, I guess that keeps it rhetorical. <laughs> that answer. It's just one more source of competition though, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, fundamentally you get back to the fact that when you get bad deals, you get bad deals when markets are really hot and when there's easy money. I mean, inevitably when there's easy, easy money to me, and I'm not going to do another Fed, um, uh, diatribe, don't worry. But you know, easy money distorts markets. It makes it easier for people to raise money to keep zombie companies alive, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and you see this in mining, certainly, um, where, you know, the prices paid for good projects can, as well as bad projects in hot markets, but even for good projects, the prices paid can just be Unbelievable. I mean, you look at, say, royalties. The big royalty companies are doing deals with a less than a 1% rate of return. And that's, that's the company's projection on what they're going to earn from the deal. Uh, and the reason is it's just, and some of them actually have negative rates of return. 
They're just sort of hoping and praying that the gold price goes up and we'll bail them out, which is not a good way of doing business, frankly. And it's not the way the best of them do it. But there's so much money in this sector that the price is, there's so much competition that the prices just get uh, uh, beaten down. You see that at different times in the, uh, you know, the business development companies. Obviously, this year has been a little bit different because because of COVID. But um, you know, last year, um, some of the prices being paid were, were 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 just extreme, and companies were not doing as many deals as they wanted to just because the prices were too high. I mean, those are obvious points, I guess. But no, that that's. I mean, to, I would add to that also. I mean, it it's there is the specific kind of consequences, but that's just in general, it creates this euphoria, right? And so let's say you work at a more uh, long, uh, a company that's been around for a long time, you're in an M&A division and you know, you see all of this activity going on, it, it gets you excited. And even if you're not directly competing against some of the deals that are currently out there in the market, it allows you to go to your boss or to go to the CEO or to go to the board and see, tell them, look at everything that's happening here, you know, generally in the markets, even if it's not their own specific industry. And once that excitement starts going, I mean, that snowball starts rolling down the hill and uh, these ideas that they should make an acquisition, you know, forget about what, what one targeted was in the past. Uh, once they get that that attitude from it, uh, you know, things things well, start happening all comes across the board. Both ways as well. In in that kind of market, you get shareholders saying, "Look, they've just done a deal. They've done a deal. Yep. Why are you sitting on cash? Why don't you do something?" Absolutely, especially when think? cash cash pays nothing right now, right? So if if you're sitting, uh, if you're if you're a corporation and you're sitting on a big chunk of cash right now and you're not returning it to shareholders. And you're making no return on that, uh, you know that that contributes for sure. I mean, one of the things we talked about GM. The other one is kind of crazy. Is the uh, is uh, Constellation uh, Liquor um, STZ, and they were they didn't do an acquisition, but they did an equity participation with uh, Canopy growth at a ridiculous price. I mean, you know, the, the, talk about euphoria. Um, I forget what the price was when when they when they did the deal with C they did it in, back in the 17 or 18 something like that, you know when test when um, Tilray if I don't know Tilray was 300 and now of course Tilray is six bucks, uh, but again you get the euphoria. Um, why the heck did uh, Constellation? And I was reading this recently about them. They think oh we have a, it's still a good deal. We expect to get this thing, you know we're supposed to, we expect to get our money back out of this thing and we, it's really it's still a good deal. And you shake your head say <laughs> in what fashion? I mean. You just lost a ton of money, you know. Jesus, you know, Oh, it'll work out in the long run. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, look, I mean, Jewel also with Altria, right? Uh, you yeah. know, you do okay. see these. Are they drunk? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, when they're making Precisely. the deals, <laughs> it was those type of deals. And of course, uh, uh, didn't Altria also do something with Hexo? Was it Altria? I don't know, but uh, another one that did. A I'm deal. not an expert on Altria, but uh, <laughs> this, this was the way. This was the I don't know that particular. Thing. I don't know that particular one, but what often happens, I've seen in certain sectors, is you know people are companies, management, and their shareholders are afraid of being left behind. You know, and you see that in the mining business. Hey, you know, Gold Corp just bought a big property. Barrick just bought a big property. Goldfields just bought a big property. Why don't you buy something? And there's pressure not to be left behind. That I, you know, that certainly happens. So let me ask you. I, I, oh, sorry, Kevin. If I might uh, go back to something that Stephen had said earlier, and I, and I would prefer to uh, talk about why why Metmanet do succeed. I think that one of the things, and I think that Stephen mentioned um, things like uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And of course, they acquire everybody, but nothing's integrated. Everybody sits sits around, does their own thing. I mean, and they buy kind of funky companies, they, they buy railroads and they buy the furniture companies, you know, furniture manufacturers. So there's no, there's no integration available at all anyway, in many, many cases. And of course they buy a lot of insurance companies. Um, but what you said, Stephen, I think this is, this is kind of one of those situations where why M&A might work is because it's a core competency of the company that is the, the acquirer, that they actually have set up a system as you called it and they execute against that particular system and then tweak the system so that it becomes better and better and better. Now, again, that's, uh, that's the, the, uh, the field of, of, of larger companies, you know, large caps. I don't know 
how, how big they are, but they have the wherewithal and the money to be able to do that. Um, well, I think that we're talking about um, where there are companies that have a very, very good strategy. They have a team of people. They have, they have the core competency existing, and they've done it a few times, as opposed to um, the idea of these, these micro cap co companies who, who want to crap or any of these companies that are a micro cap type of company and they want to do a roll up. Okay, so uh, the roll up strategy is it's absolutely fraught with these potential problems. And, you know, again, you know, where's the expertise? I mean, is the, is the CEO of the roll up company, is that, that person an expert in acquisitions? Because damn well better be. You know, so there's, I think that there's a very interesting uh, space to fill between the inexperienced CEO who wants to become, you know, a, a, a roll-up company to the companies, <laughs> excluding GM, of course, uh, to the companies that have a, a core competency on acquisition and do it again and again and again and do it very, very well. I mean, is there uh, is there a balance? I mean, where do we where do we put the seesaw? I mean, I think we're, uh, you know, I throw the question back to everybody here. I mean, just because we're because we're mostly speaking in hindsight you know after you know a little bit of time since the deal was announced i mean what have you seen kevin steve and adrian in terms of a successful formula that kind of has that balance of everything that kevin has just spoke about where and and you saw that it was a success you know leave anybody well i think it's to what what your point uh bobby when first of all price matters let's keep that in mind but second of all, um, you know, the Disney Marvel deal, I, I mean, it, there, it, it made as great as Marvel was, it made it even better, you know? And, and when you find and if, same thing with Facebook and Instagram, for example, I mean, at the time, the Instagram price seemed outrageous, outrageously high. And, uh, but to be able to bring on the Facebook over time, the Facebook ad platform, it's, it makes the value of Instagram uh, exponentially higher than it would have been on its own or with a different acquirer. And you can go back even further, look at say Fox or Fox, uh, um, what's it, the Rupert Murdoch um, buying uh, MySpace, right? <laughs> so many years ago uh, that there was just no ability there to make the MySpace um you know, to, to make it better or more than what it was. And, um, and I think when you look at, you know, what's successful or what's not over the long term, when you're setting aside kind of the price, uh, it, it is that ability to, you know, look again for Valiant giving shelf space that otherwise would not have been there for an acquisition or subsidiary, um, you know, giving a distribution platform greater than what it had previously had, like in Marvel's case. Uh, and, you know, it's not, it's not always the integration in terms of, you know, actually combining things. It's, it's giving access sometimes and getting additional distribution. So this is actually a nice transition because we, we've talked about hindsight. We could do case studies for days on, you know, bad deals, the good deals, you know, all, all the, the minutia that went into each one of those, but, you know, all of us cover them, you know, we look at the markets on more or less a daily basis, you know, we see when the deals happen day of most of the time, you know, when you first see that announcement, company did a deal, you know, here's the price, here's the strategy, you know, what, what would you say, uh, um, how do you evaluate that deal when you first see the announcement and you're a, and, and trying to take a step back and understand, all right, could this be a good deal or could this be a bad deal? It's obviously impossible to know whether it will be good or bad right then and there. You know, the proof is in the pudding. You need a little bit of time. But when you first see that deal, you know, what are some of the questions that you ask yourselves in order to evaluate whether it could be a good or bad deal? So, Kevin, let's start with you. Um, I mean, it, it, it's all about hindsight, Bobby. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. It's a question of how it plays out. Um, one can look at it on an initial basis and sit down and say, it makes sense. Um, you know, so GM getting into, 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 uh, into an agreement with Nicola kind of makes sense. I mean, they need the technology. Um, they are competing, again, as, the, as I said, Ford has a similar relationship with Rivian, which is a private company. Um, they, Ford's invested, I think the number is over a billion in this Rivian company. Uh, so it may very well be that GM needed to do exactly what Adrian said is that, well, why don't you buy somebody, you know, right now, because Ford's got somebody, blah, blah, blah. 
So it might very well be that, um, you know, it's, it's done as a result of pressure, but on the surface, it sounded pretty good. I mean, they, they, they're gonna, these companies are gonna make a lot of money ultimately in, in electric vehicles. So, um, I mean, that one sounds pretty good. I mean, there are others. I mean, there were smaller opportunities that come up and you sit down and say, you know, some of them are, you can see as, as Stephen was saying, you buy for distribution, you buy for location, you buy for uh, customer base, et cetera. So I think one evaluates on the very, very surface of it um, against those criteria. Now, those criteria aren't specific, aren't, generally are not uh, outlined in any sort of uh, news release or uh, filing or anything of that type that says we did it for these particular reasons, you know, in, in detail, just that we did it and we hope to have the synergies, yada, yada, yada. You can fill in all the blanks yourself. Um, but again, it's, 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 it's a, you know, it's one of those things where I think it all plays out. I mean, everybody's wrong. <laughs> Ultimately, you know, right. Well, I guess maybe, I guess maybe the key question is cause you know, you bring up a good point. It's like, it's really easy to get your head around. Even if you, even if you're not a believer in the company that the acquirer is buying, you can at least make a case of like, all right, I see what they're doing. It makes sense to a degree, or you can at least you know, I, I think we're all relatively smart people here. We can at least make an argument as to why it might make sense. So at what point then do maybe you, do you pause? Do you, I mean, is it, is it when you start thinking about price that the, that the acquirer is paying, you know, yeah, what, for me, I'm always shocked by the price. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what, so huh. we'll just start there. And then over yeah. time, sometimes it starts to make sense. And most of the time it doesn't. Yeah. I figured it was price. I figured that like, if you had to have that one thing that take you back, you're like, huh? price yeah price is obviously uh, critical and, and again steve mentioned berkshire if you're looking at berkshire you're looking at you know what company are they buying you're looking at the price and the potential for it to recover grow whatever but you're not looking as as we've all said you're not looking at integration or anything but if if you're looking at um one mining company buying another mining company um you do want some kind of synergy uh, you want you want you, you want to be you want to see where the cost savings are. You know, it's a different kind of deal. You're not buying an electric vehicle company to sort of you, you know establish yourself in that space or anything. You're just buying another mining company, and so in order for that to work, you either you have to have cost savings and you have to have some kind of synergy. Um, uh, but again, enables you to to cut costs and perhaps you, you, you have to be able to see something in your target's property that they have not seen. Uh, some particular way of expanding the project, um, making it bigger. But, um, you know, if you just buy a mine and continue to run it, there's, there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to do the acquisition. You know, there's no benefit for anyone in that. Hey, Adrian, just on a, uh, I'm un totally unknowledgeable of uh, mining operations, but just throw something out. I mean, if a company is a gold mining business and, you know, again, is, it, is, is the gold part of it the important part or is mining the important part? And then secondly, is that, so if, say for example, you, you wanted to get into cobalt mining, okay? Can a gold company undertake a cobalt mining business or is the metal um, something that is, it, it, nobody really cares about the metal. It's about, it's about how it's mined or mining. Is it? I mean, are we talking about gold to gold, silver to silver, you know, rare earths to rare earths, or is it something that mining is just mining and doesn't really and, matter what the metal is? And Adrian, before you answer that, for people who don't know about mining anything, think of this as a metaphor as well. So uh, Adrian, sorry. Go think ahead. of it as a what? Think of it as a metaphor as well for any other industry, you know, with a uh, gold to gold yeah. or cobalt to gold. But uh, anyways. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I 100% understood the question. Are you saying can a gold mining company have the same skill set and mine cobalt or mine copper? Was that the question? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think when you get to the major companies, you know, BHP, Rio, whatever, they have the skill sets to, you know, buy iron ore, buy, buy uranium. I think you have to be exceptionally careful when you look at. Uh, junior companies, which have much more limited expertise at the top, 
when a when a when a when a uh, the CEO or the the team's entire experience is with gold mining, but cobalt becomes hot, so they want to get a cobalt property or they want to get a rare earths property or lithium, because first of all the markets are different, totally different type of markets. But yes, the mining the mining is is definitely is definitely different. See, Kevin, so you, have to be, you have to be very very wary wary of that. Um, yeah, I was going to say the real question should have been, you know, can a junior company, uh, you know, can you expect them to be still a good company when they're looking at cannabis assets? You know, that's, well, that's real, that, that that's should have been the real that's question. A more extreme diversion, but you get that a lot. You know, when gold's flat and rare earths are sort of hot, all the gold miners become rare earth miners or looking for rare earth. They're not actually mining anything. A lot, of, a lot of name changes. But the other thing I, I would say a lot, you mentioned cobalt in particular. You know, cobalt tends to be a byproduct. So you don't go out and look for a cobalt mine and mine cobalt. You look for a copper mine that has cobalt as a, as a byproduct. So, you know, it's a little bit different. So the metals is one thing. But when you get into uranium, um, iron ore, rare earths, you know, that's, that's different from your basic... Um, your basic uh, base metals because a, a gold miner can do base metal mining a base metal miner can you know a copper miner can mine nickel etc that's not a problem yeah. well but you, you said the same thing it's, a, it's kind of the same question applied is can a beer company um manage an acquisition of a cannabis company well okay i understand the nature of why they did it i mean beer companies see the decline in beer sales while cannabis companies are actually increasing and there's all kinds of different values associated with what they could, what, what the beer companies could actually put into their beer that's cannabis related. I mean, they could put in terpines and all that stuff and change the, change the mix. Um, but again, it goes back to the issue is that can a, can a company that's in one business uh, propose that they can be successful uh, in, in an acquisition of a completely different business or, or an equity position in a completely different business? Yeah, no. Can an online marketplace buy a, a grocery market? You know, can a you know? I mean, it, it's the 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 questions like this can go on for days, and it really just I don't know. Maybe it just comes down to management. I mean, Kevin and Stephen, you and Adrian, you all made that point earlier that it's and they yes, <laughs> because they have, <laughs> and uh, you know that's that's the whole thing is that you know some companies too start to deviate or to, I mean, Amazon, Whole Foods, different situation, I, I suppose. But once you get into this euphoric environment, uh, anything can be justified in the short term. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the chickens come home to roost. Is that the phrase in a couple of years, I suppose, once the euphoria dies down? Hey, Stephen, come back to you real quick. You know, you said you, you look at special situations. M&A certainly falls under special situations. So as an investor that looks at special situations um you know what what are some of the things that you look for then if you're if when when you're looking at potentially uh, some m a deals yeah i mean I, I think and so i'll say this before i started uh, my fund about eight nine years ago I, I was actually a lawyer and i did some m a and did some is more of the regulatory side uh you know forgive me kevin yeah. um, oh, lawyer oh. recovered though recovered um but uh but anyway, it showed me the pitfalls, right? It showed me the, the certain regulatory issues or when you're investigating a company, you're reading their, their emails or the senior management, you see their decision-making and geez, like it's usually, you know, certainly there are big teams here that do a great deal of work and analysis and it's very impressive, but the ultimately the, the people on top who are excited about something, um, they're just excited about it, you know? And, and I've seen these emails from dozens of companies uh, between kind of the CFO or the CEO or the you know chairman or something like that, where they just want to do a deal, right? And then all of the impressive work to justify it is, is you know, it is rightfully impressive. So, you know, I guess, you know, what would I look for? I mean, I would generally want to see growth without acquisitions, quite frankly, at companies that I own like if we're saying talking about an acquire or a company, um, I want the company that I I'll own to have enough of a runway of of their own reinvestment opportunities at, at you know reasonable returns before they need to go out and make an acquisition. If I'm talking about a company that I might own that I would like to be acquired, you know, then you're generally I mean for me I'd like 
you know, you want small caps, <laughs> micro cap, you know, companies that could get bought out at, at multiples of their stock price, not at a 10% premium. <laughs> and so when you're in a euphoric market um, and, and you own, you know, you're looking to own companies that might want to get bought out. Uh, yeah. I think you want it to be smaller. You want it to be in kind of in a, in a sexier industry um, and uh, something you might not necessarily want to own long-term. I mean, you do want to own, if, if we are in this environment, you want to own Nikola, not GM, <laughs> right? Uh, you want to own the company that is going to be partnered with uh, that, um, that has this kind of hype machine associated with it. Potentially terrible long-term investments, but you know, short-term, that's what we're in right now. I generally avoid those things, but uh, you know, that's, that's where I would be at. You, you made a comment, Stephen, uh, about talking to management and getting to see the flow of information and things of that type. And it's generally, everybody's patting each other on the back. Um, as uh, when I go into a one-on-one -on -one with various CEOs, one of the things I do is I try to go for the jugular, um, asking stupid questions that they can't answer. Um, but the, the, the point here is, is when, you're, when you're asking management, about, or when the management is telling you the, all these great things about how this deal is going to benefit the company and it's yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. First question I have is that, tell me why it will go to shit, okay? Tell me what's going to happen. Tell me what's going to happen in three months. Tell me where the pitfalls are. Tell me where, where you haven't thought about something or have you thought about this? I mean, those are the things that I would kind of get into is if, I, if as Bobby said, if you get it on first, on first blush, say that yeah, makes sense. But then after, after you sit down and let that go by, then you start getting into it. Again, it's, it's, it's being able to admit, talk to the management team and having them, you know, maybe your CalPERS or something like that, they come in and sit down and say, we're going to invest a ton of money in you. What we want to know is this, okay? And they can't answer that. They, they fumble and they mumble. And, I don't know, and, they, and you, that, Those are the things I think are becoming more important in the vetting uh, by investors and others who, who see the value but want to make sure that, that the value is, uh, is uh, been thought about in, in depth. And, and once they begin to sit down and, and um, have a difficulty being able to tell you where it could go to crap, okay? I think that's when you start to walk, walk out the door. They, so have Kevin, to they have to understand that the thing can go to shit. See, Kevin, this is where I've been trying to get you to this entire time is just saying like, thinking about where everything, where it could go to shit. I think that's probably the best question that any investor listening to this could, should think about when it comes to any m a or i mean any kind of announcement you know how can this go to shit you know i think that's exactly a really we right from the beginning they all go to 80 percent of them go to shit from what i have read okay um so the, the it's not like 50 think about it all the time 38 percent. it's a lot of them okay and again this may this may have changed but um again there are a lot of hidden acquisitions that are done that nobody knows about as i was saying this is something that this professor did a book on you know, the academic style book, you know, he found 10 cases and nine of them were crap and he, he did it again, but that was some data. Um, but again, if it's, if we find out that indeed, uh, that the majority of m as go to crap, then 80%, let's just take that as a, as a, as a figure. Then the only thing that you should be doing is, <laughs> is pursuing the crap side of it. Not the, not the thing that's going to work out. Uh, again, it's 20% versus 80%. I want to find out what's going on in the 80%. So, you know, again, it's, it's um, it's hard work, it's hard questioning, and sometimes you make the you make the CEO feel like a you know feel like crap. Why did you? Do, did I tell you I asked one time, I asked that CEO one time. I said, "Tell me why you're the CEO," and he couldn't answer the question. Literally, he couldn't remember, answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I no, mean, I, I mean I always ask that question, not just mergers and acquisitions, but of any company I'm I'm investigating. I might put it a little more delicately than you did, Kevin, but that's because I'm English. But well, no, I always ask, is, well, how did it go to shite? Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, if a person can't answer that, it really says something about the person's, you know, uh, uh, the, the person's self-awareness, the person's um, esteem, the person's ego. It says a lot. And in, if I'm looking at a, 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 let's say, a gold mining company and the only thing they can tell me that might go wrong is the price of gold goes down, that's not a very good answer. Um, <laughs> You know, what could go wrong? Well, the economy could collapse. Okay, yeah, we, we realize that. We're talking about your particular company. And if they can't answer it, there's something really wrong. It's not about existential. It's all about me and my execution, our ability of being able to pull this thing off. Well, they think they're so brilliant and so yeah, great, exactly. but, um, you know, nothing could go wrong unless it comes from external sources.
you know, Trump, ra Biden raises our taxes or something. It wasn't our fault. Very good stuff. All right. You know, we're, we're about there. So love to get everybody's final takes on M and a, um, you guys, you all more or less gave your thoughts on where you think it's going and continuing to go, or maybe we're still in a ramp up phase for going into 2021, but you know, let, let's get, I'd love to get everybody's final thoughts on M and a uh, going forward. So uh, we're going to do counterclockwise against Steven. Let, let's start with you. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to add at this point, to be honest with you, other than um, I'm just as skeptical now as I was in the beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we'll go from there. I guess, you know, if there's any final takeaway, it's uh, try to be the acquiree company and not the acquirer company, if that's what you want to own as a as an investor. Uh, but that's risky, too. Very good. Kevin? Uh, yeah, I think it's nice to be the acquiree because I don't know what the percentages are, but there's a very, very good chance you can buy your company back at cheap, at cheap money. There you go. Adrian? Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate, I mean, typically when, when the market's hot, when there's a lot of deals, and when money is easy, that's when you're going to get more bad deals than, than when the market's really, really collapsed. Very good. All right. Well, with that, love to get it where everybody can go and find more information about you all. So uh, Adrian, where can everybody go and find more information on uh, Adrian Day Asset Management? Yeah, the website's um, adriandayassetmanagement.com. Very cool. And uh, Kevin, where can people go and follow The Good Prick? At The Good Prick. There we go. Twitter. Actually, my account has become quite active. Yes, it has. Um, I am, I am, I am uh, unabashedly seeking new followers. Um, <clears throat> I am now at, at because of because basically because of you and Stephen have chosen <laughs> a, a path where it goes, it's a little bit of this a little bit of that I even I even ranted last night that why can't they sell porter and six ounce six ounce containers I mean <clears throat> I don't want an entire porter of beer you know it, it's going on all over the place you know pictures stuff you know Stephen, should we feel bad a little bit? I mean, we've created an obsession for Kevin, right? Well, now. Once he this gets is... on TikTok, I think. Well, you know, we were talking about Instagram earlier. I don't think Kevin, do you have an, an Instagram page as of yet? Maybe is. that's the next step, <laughs> yeah. and then after that, TikTok. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling okay right now, but I think that next step, we'll see what he posts on Instagram because he's only putting a couple pictures now. I'm not seeing like. He's not on the beach or anything yet, you know. Um, it, it's more more business related. Here. I'm, ex to, I'm excited for when Kevin posts on this. He's an incredible photographer, so yeah. he's, I can't I can't wait to see some of his photos. Up yeah, there. create create an Instagram page and put up some of those uh, those photos there, Kevin. We'd love to see it. Yeah. All right, Stephen, where can everybody go and follow you and uh, get more information on you and our Arquitos Capital? Yeah, you can find me at our uh, at arquitos.com and uh, also willowoakfunds.com is the. Um, a platform uh, that I, I run as well, the uh, Willow Candles uh, operations for uh, affiliate uh, firms and funds. Uh, Twitter as well, uh, Stephen underscore Keel, K-I-E-L, and uh, look forward to talking with you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Again, my name is Robert Kraft. You can find me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-E-F-T. You can listen and watch every episode of the Investors Roundtable on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash SNN Wire. And now every audio version of the Investors Roundtable will be on the Planet Microcap podcast stream, which you can listen wherever you get podcasts. And uh, with that, have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good to see you, everyone.